family and society are not going to help you most of the time with a her heroic adventure, right? They're going to be a barrier well, versus a the, in good families, they're both because they put up constraints on your behavior, but they like, I've interviewed a lot of successful people mm -hmm. about their calling, mm -hmm. let's say, because that's, I do that with all my podcast guests. How, how did the path that you took to success make itself manifest? And it's, it's very, the pattern's very typical. Almost all the people that I've interviewed had a mother and a father. Now, it's not invariant, but I'd say it's there in 99% of the time, it's really high. And both of the parents, or at least one of them, but often both, were very encouraging of the person's interests and pathway to development. That's fascinating. I've, I've heard you analyze it that way before, and I, I had a reaction to that idea because you focus on the positive of the parents. Yeah, I feel like it was the maybe I I see biographies differently, but it feels like the struggle within the family was the catalyst for greatness in 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 a lot of biographies. Maybe I'm misinterpreting it. No, but I no, just, no. Parent... I don't think you. I think that that's a reflection. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's a reflection of that dynamic between positive and negative emotion. Like my son, for example, who's doing just fine. Um, He's firing on all cylinders, as far as I'm concerned. He has a nice family. He gets along with his wife. He's a really good musician. He's got a company. He's running well. Um, he's, he's a delight to be around. He was a relatively disagreeable infant. He was tough-minded. And so, and he, he didn't take no for an answer. And so, there was some tussle in regulating his behavior. He spent a lot of time when he was two sitting on the steps trying to get his act together. And so that was the constraint, and the, and but that wasn't that wasn't something that was. It's an opposition to him away because it was in opposition to the immediate manifestation of his hedonistic desires. But it was also an impetus to further development. My, the rule for me, when he was on the stairs, was as soon as you're willing to be a civilized human being, you can get off the stairs. And you might think, well, that's nothing but arbitrary, superego, patriarchal, oppressive constraint. Or you could say, well, no, what I'm actually doing is facilitating his cortical maturation. Because when a child misbehaves, it's usually because they're under the domination of some primordial emotional or motivational impulse. They're angry, they're overenthusiastic, they're, they're upset, um, they're selfish, like it's narrow self-centeredness expressed in a immature manner. But see, okay, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but it feels like the engine of greatness, at least on the male side of things, has often been trying to prove the f father wrong or trying to gain the acceptance of the father. So that tension where the parent is not encouraging, like you mentioned, but is basically saying, no, you, you won't be able to do okay, this. So my observation as a psychologist has been that it's very, very difficult for someone to get their act together unless they have at least one figure in their life that's encouraging and sh shows them the pathway forward. So, so you can have a lot of adversity in your life. And if you have one person around who's a good model and you're neurologically intact, you can latch onto that model. Now, you can also find that model in books. And people do that sometimes. Like I've interviewed people who had pretty frag fragmented childhoods who turned to books and found the pattern that guided them in, like, let's say, the, the, the adventures of the heroes of the past, because that's a good way of thinking about it. And I read a, a book called Angela's Ashes that was written by an Irish author, Frank McCourt. It's a fantastic book, beautiful book. And his father was an alcoholic of gargantuan proportions. He just, an, an Irish drinker who drank every cent that came into the family and many of whose children died in poverty. And what Frank did is a testament to the human spirit is he sort of divided his father conceptually into two elements. There was sober mourning father who was encouraging and with whom he had a relationship. And then there was drunk and useless later afternoon and evening father. And he rejected the negative and he amplified his relationship with the positive. Now, like he had other, he had other things going for him, but he, you know, he did a very good job of discriminating. And, and I mean, partly the question that you're raising is to what degree is it useful to have a beneficial adversary? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, and I mean, struggle-free progress is not possible. And I think there are situations under which where, you know, you might be motivated to prove someone in your immediate circle wrong. But then that also implies that at some level, for some reason, you actually care about their judgment. You know, you just didn't write them off completely. Well, I mean, that's why I say there's an archetype of a young man trying to gain the approval of his father. Mm -hmm. And I think that repeats itself in a bunch of biographies that I've read. I don't know, there must have been an engine somewhere that they found of approval, of uh, encouragement. Maybe in books, maybe in the mother, or maybe the, the, the role of the parents is flipped. Well, my, my father was hard to please. Very. Did you ever succeed? Yes. But it wasn't easy, ever. When, when, when was the moment when you uh, succeeded? Late, pretty late. Like 40, maybe later. Was it a uh, gradual or a definitive moment when a shift happened? My father always was always willing to approve of the things I did that were good, although he was not effusive by any stretch of the imagination, and the standards were very high. Now, I was probably fortunate for me, you know, and, I, and I, it does bear on the question you're asking. It's like, if you want someone to motivate you optimally, God, it's complicated because there has to be a temperamental dance between the two people. Like, what you really want is for someone to apply the highest possible standards to you that you're capable of reaching. Right? And that's a that's a that's a vicious dance because you have to have a relationship with your child to do that properly. You know, because you wanna if you want to be optimally motivating as a father, you keep your children on the edge. It's like you might not reward something in your child that you would think would be good in someone else because you think they could do better. And so my father was pretty clear about the idea that he always expected me to do better. And was that troublesome? It was like, I felt often when I was young that there was no pleasing him, but I also knew that that wasn't, I knew that that wasn't right. See, I actually knew that wasn't right because I could remember, especially I think when I was very young, that I did things that he was pleased about. I knew that was possible. So it wasn't, it wasn't unpredictable and arbitrary. It was just difficult. It sounds like he's hit a pretty good optimal, but it's uh, for each individual human that optimal differs. Well, and that's why you have to hard. have a relationship with your children. You have to know them, and and well, with yourself too, and and with your wife. You 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 can't hit that optimal. That optimal is probably love. That's because love isn't just acceptance. Love is acceptance and encouragement. And it's not just that either. It's also, no, don't do that. That's beneath you. You're capable of more. And how harsh should that be? It's like, that's a really hard question. You know, like if you really love someone, you're not going to put up with their stupidity. Don't do that. You know, one of the rules I had with my little kids was, don't do anything that makes you look like an idiot in public. Why? Because I don't want you disgracing yourself. Why not? Because I like you. I think you're great. And you're not going to act like a bloody fool in public so that people get the wrong idea about you.